Hello interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Uh, I've got a custom built computer here with boot MGR is missing on the screen when you turn it on. Um, so this is a very common fault that can hit anything that runs Windows. Uh, so whether it's a desktop computer, you know, a gaming rig like this, an all-in-one or a laptop, uh, or even a tablet, you know, anything like that that runs Windows, uh, runs Windows can hit this issue. So firstly, let's just do a quick bit of groundwork. What is boot MGR? So boot MGR is the boot manager, also known as the boot loader. And what that is, is it's a small program that sits at the very front of your hard drive that tells the computer how to get Windows running when you turn it on. So what it's going to do is it's going to tell when the computer turns on and, bi and your uh, BIOS or EFI um, initializes all the hardware, it's going to look for a boot manager to start an operating system. And then the Windows boot manager is going to say, I have a Windows installation here and I will start it up under the following conditions. And those conditions could be normal mode or safe mode or network disabled or you know VGA only and so on and so forth. So that's why we have a boot manager in the first place is just so there is something to tell Windows under what state it should start. And so if your boot manager is missing, then obviously you can't start Windows because there's nothing to load it up. So that's what has happened here. Now, there are various quick fixes to get boot manager repaired. Um, and uh, if you have actually, if you broke boot manager, if you know what you did wrong, then you might be looking for those quick fixes. Um, and I will get to those and I will put some links in the description, timestamping where those are in this video. So if you just want the please bro quick fixes, you can jump to them if you want. But I do recommend hanging around while we investigate how this can happen in the first place, just in case that applies to you. So let's investigate that. Because the problem is, is Boot Manager doesn't just commit Sudoku on its own. Um, it doesn't just scramble itself for zero reason. Or, you know, I mean, it could but it's pretty unlikely to. So we need to ask ourselves, why has this happened in the first place? Now, um, in this instance, when my client brought this computer to me, they said that the computer had been crashing on the week on the run up to this. They've had blue screens and it's been crashing. And what, when it originally happened, they'd left the computer running. They came back and the computer was just off. And when they turned it on again, they got boot manager is missing. So this computer has been having a bad time on the run up to this. So I don't think that this is just simply a software glitch. I don't think this is a Windows update that didn't install properly or something like that because the computer has been having a rough time of it. So uh, we need to run some hardware tests to find out what might have happened to cause this. So let's take a look at the hardware we've got in front of us. So as you can see, we've got quite a we've got a really nice clean gaming rig here um we've got a skylake platform down here corsair water cooler we've got an msi 970 nice corsair power supply and then we've got a dual drive setup with a western Digi two terabyte hard drive and a corsair 128 gig ssd um so firstly we want to do a visual inspection to see if there's any reason why this computer may have been having a bad time you know are there any are there any cables that are loose or hanging out you know, everything is plugged in correctly. It all looks really nice. It's a very clean, honest build. Um, the fans are all spinning. Those are all working. Uh, the water cooling system is working. I can feel water flow in those pipes. So that's all good. Um, I can't feel any heat coming off the radiator, but you know, I don't think that's gonna be our issue. I don't think this thing would have been overheating, but we will do a check for that when we finish servicing this computer. We'll just quickly run it up to temperature and make sure that that is working. Um, however, if that was the issue, then that's not something we're going to look at right now. Um, so uh, the visual inspection is a pass then. However, we do notice that we do have an SSD um, and that is slightly more awkward to test. So we need to check our SSD to make sure that that's OK. And then the other thing that I want to do is because we've been getting blue screens, I want to check the memory as well to make sure that there's nothing wrong with the memory modules. Because if we've got a bad memory module in there, we're just going to keep having problems. And even if we fix the boot manager, it's just going to get scrambled again by bad memory. So let's look into that. Let's start working on our SSD first, because um, once we get that onto some kind of test cycle or backup cycle, we can check the memory while that progress bar is running. So let's turn this thing off. Uh, and pull the SSD out.
Now, unfortunately, to really do this job properly, you will need another computer on hand, um, just simply because if your computer's in a non-starting condition, then unfortunately, you need something to do your diagnostics with. Um, it is possible to get out of this um, just by reinstalling Windows, uh, and we'll get to that a bit later on. Um, however, just sadly, the nature of computer repair is that if you want to do the no data loss um, solution, you're going to need another computer on hand. So find your family computer, borrow a mate's computer, something like that. What we need to do now is we need to connect this SSD up to um, our diagnostics machine in order to uh, try and recover the data from it uh, and check if it's okay. So uh, you can use a laptop or a desktop computer with this um, and depending on what you have depends on how you can connect it. So if you've got another desktop computer, then that will have serial ATA cables in it, like your source computer. And you can just plug this thing into a spare serial ATA connector in the computer. And that's what I'm gonna do with my workstation. Alternatively, uh, if you don't have um, a desktop or if you've got a laptop, you can use a hard drive dock like this. So this is just, uh, this is a hard drive dock that can take two and a half inch or three and a half inch hard drives. And it just adapts to USB. And I've got USB output from there and just a power connector for the drive as well. Alternatively, other flavors that you might see is something like this. Uh, this is just simply a cable adapter. We've got USB at one end and at the other end, I've got serial ATA and then I've got the old uh, legacy parallel ATA connectors as well. So I can also connect it up by that. So, so I can just plug this guy into the back of the SSD and now I have a USB connection to another computer. Um, so this is fine as well. It's not as quick as a serial ATA can interface, but it works. So. Uh, let's get this hooked up. Ah. Okay, so if I right click on the start menu and click computer management, and we'll just put that over there and go to disk management, this will show me all the partitions and disks I've got connected to the computer at the moment. So the first two drives here, this Western Digi Red uh, and this 250 gig SSD, those are the system drives on my uh, diagnostic machine, on my host computer. And then I can see we've got a 120 gig drive that has appeared at the bottom at disk two. So that's the drive we've just plugged in. And as you can see, that's the label Corsair, which is another, another giveaway there. And this has got a fairly typical partition setup. We've got the 100 megabyte system reserve partition at the front. That is where our bootloader should be located. Then we've got the uh, the main uh, partition that has the Windows install on it. I don't want to call it a system partition because it's... We refer to it as a system partition because you've got your Windows system on there, but there's system partitions and then there's system partitions. The point is that's where Windows is. And then finally, we've got a recovery partition perched out on the end. So this is a completely standard setup here with the three partitions. So the first thing that I want to do is because this is a customer computer, um, at the moment, there is a danger to the data because the computer doesn't turn on. So what I want to do is I want to take a backup of this drive. Um, and this will achieve two things. Firstly, it will take a copy of the data so we know that we won't lose anything. And in addition to that, while we're trying to back up the drive, we can, find, we can look at it and see how it's behaving and see if there's any reason to believe that there's a problem with it. So I'm going to start up the backup program I use, which is called Drive Snapshot. Now Drive Snapshot is an imaging program that I use. You can download it from drivesnapshot.de and uh, this creates disk images of drives, which is very useful for archiving um, drives. That's what disk images are. Um, so the easiest way to demonstrate this is just to run it and show you it in action. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to back up a disk to a file and now I need to select what I want to back up. So I'm gonna scroll down here and as you can see, it's showing me exactly the same partitions um, as we saw in disk management. So here's our Corsair Force disk down the bottom. So I'm gonna shift click to select all three partitions at the bottom. We're gonna back up all of them, but just, just because never not. So we'll click next. And now it's gonna ask me where I wanna save it. So I'm gonna specify a location to save this. And I'm gonna put that under my backups directory and I'm going to stick that under a directory called Fractal Custom because this is in a Fractal case. So that's just how I recognize my computers. Fractal Custom. And I'm going to name it disk.sna. Um, and uh, sorry, dollar disk.sna. 
and uh, dollar disk is a variable which tells it to save the file name as whatever the drive name was. So in this case, it will create uh, file names for each of the three partitions automatically. So let's go ahead and hit start copy. So this is now going to use the Windows built-in imaging system. And the really handy thing about this is you can actually do this with live, with live drives. Uh, I can actually snapshot the Windows drive that I'm actually running on at the moment. So what snapshot is a really handy tool because you don't have to boot into an offline environment to use it. You can just run this on any computer just by running the app, which is very useful to me. So it's going through these system partitions. And now I think we're onto the main partition now. Yes, yeah, so we're now onto E drive. And what that's going to do is it's going to copy everything on that and save it into an archive file. And it shows us the estimated time remaining and also the speed. So we're getting a good speed out of it at the moment. We're on 5600 megs per second. Um, and that will probably build up because we're saving from an SSD to a fairly high speed hard drive. We should actually start getting fairly decent speeds out of this. So the speed itself is an indicator of the health of the drive. If you're getting a really bad speed, like as long as you're on serial 88 or USB 3 and you're only getting a couple of hundred megs per minute, then there's obviously something wrong with that drive because it should be transferring much faster than that. In this case, we're currently transferring at 6,000 megabytes per minute, and that clocks in at that's something like 100 megs per second, I think. Um, so that sounds about right because where I'm saving to an SSD, uh, sorry, where I'm saving to a hard drive, most hard drives they write at about 100 megs per second, so that's realistic. This drive, uh, my Western Digital Red is capable of faster speeds than that, so we'll probably see that climb up a bit, but it's realistic, which is what is important here. So. I'm going to leave that to do, its, uh, to do its backup now. And while that backs up, I'm now going to start running Memtest on the computer to see if the memory is OK. So let's switch back to the computer while our backup runs. So I'm going to get my Memtest 86 flash drive. Uh, so if you Google search for Memtest 86, and it will come up with the website. And you can download Memtest 86 for free. And you can download it as an ISO. And then you can use a utility such as Rufus uh, to write that ISO to a USB flash drive. And then you have a memory testing tool on a flash drive, which is what I'm going to do here. So let's plug that into the back of the machine. And now we'll turn the computer back on. Right, so usually in order to boot from a flash drive, you need to do F11 or F12. So I'm just going to spam both of them. And in this case, I can see at the bottom of the screen, it says F11 for boot menu. So the F11 did it. Okay, so uh, the flash drive I plugged in was a Corsair Voyager Mini, so we can see that at the top. So I'm just going to hit enter to boot from my USB flash drive. And now we're starting up Memtest 86. So it's going to just check the information on the computer. And then it'll take us to the boot menu. So this is the Memtest 86. You can interrupt this for special things, or if I just wait for a couple of seconds, it will automatically start. Okay, so now we're running the memory test, and uh, I've done videos on running Memtest 86 before. Um, so if you search my channel for, mem for memory testing or testing RAM or something like that, uh, you'll come up with this. Um, so, but the, the long and the short of it is, um, this is going to go through and write various patterns to RAM and then read them back to make sure that they were saved correctly. And by writing particular kind of patterns, it can try and catch the memory out and trigger very common faults to happen with it. Um, so. Uh, there are about, there's like 10 or 11 tests to a complete pass for Memtest. So uh, as you can see on the screen at the top, we've got pass 33% and test 96 and rising. Um, so it will go through various tests, but really what you want is one complete pass. And uh, on a modern computer, we've got 16 gigs of RAM in this thing. I would expect that to take about half an hour, 45 minutes, that kind of time. And during that test, we want to see zero errors. So where it says errors about in the middle of the screen there, we want that to stay up firmly on zero. Any errors at all is a fail. It doesn't necessarily mean that the memory is the problem, but it means there is an issue with the memory system, uh, which is probably going to be bad memory. However, a bad motherboard and sometimes even a bad CPU can also trigger fails in Memtest 86. So if you are getting memory errors, you have another problem entirely. I'm not going to go into that in this video unless we hit it. 
Um, however, just be aware that false positives are a thing and you need to learn to interpret the results. However, if you do start cl clocking up errors in Memtest 86, at least that gives you somewhere to start working with. So uh, I'm gonna leave this to run and we're gonna check back in on our backup because I can see on my screen that we have something interesting to look at there. So what's this I see? Snapshot is running and it's picking up unreadable sectors. So it's picking up bad sectors on our SSD. So here's our smoking gun. As you can see, the transfer speed is crashing. We're down to, we're down to just over 3000 megs per minute. So our transfer speed is drastically dropping and we're clocking up a couple of hundred unreadable sectors. So let's talk about that. So a hard drive is divided up into sectors. The sector is the smallest thing you can get on a hard drive. Then um, multiple sectors go into blocks. Then blocks are in cylinders. Cylinders are on platters and so on and so forth. However, sector is the smallest amount of uh, information you can store on a hard drive. Now, SSDs technically don't have sectors because they don't work in the same way that a mechanical hard drive does. So normally scanning for bad sectors on an SSD doesn't work. That's not how you diagnose a faulty SSD. Um, because what they do is they emulate having sectors so uh, legacy computers could understand them. So, however, and the other thing to bear in mind as well is that SSDs wear down. It's quite common for sections of an SSD to fail and be reallocated. All SSDs will have a, a section of storage uh, either at the very beginning or just somewhere on the drive that is unallocated and invisible to the computer. And when the firmware detects that a section of the drive has worn out or otherwise failed, it automatically reallocates that from some of the spare space that it has. And you can also do a thing called over provisioning where you increase that amount of empty spare space for additional reliability. And that can be useful in mission critical situations where data loss is just absolutely not an option. However, it's generally overkill for most scenarios. If you back up, you don't have this problem basically. So even though it's quite common to find bad sec well, bad sectors on an SSD where it has reallocated worn out sections of the drive, the, co the computer, so Windows, should not be able to see those because this is all done at the firmware level. So the fact that I am seeing these unreadable sectors means that there is a problem with the drive. Something has gone wrong here. So we, uh, so at this point, it looks like we have a bad SSD. So can we run any tests that will actually give us a black and white yes, no answer on this? Um, well, sometimes you can. Because SSDs are fairly specialist according to the firmware that they're running and the type of controller they have and stuff like that, you need a diagnostic test that's specific to the SSD. Most of the time with hard drives, I would be running something like CTools for Windows. And CTools for Windows can run a generic sector scan on any traditional hard drive and tell you if there's bad sectors there or not. So if you have a hard drive rather than an SSD, I recommend running CTools for Windows and run a long generic test, and that'll just give you a black and white answer on if the drive is okay. However, that's not gonna help us on an SSD. So the brand we have here, we've got a Corsair Force SSD. So what we can do is we can check if Corsair have any diagnostics tools for this. And the answer to that is yes. Corsair do actually have an SSD toolbox, which is a utility for checking the SSD, checking its health, over provisioning, erasing, and stuff like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start up the uh, Corsair SSD toolbox, and we'll just see what it has. Here's one I installed earlier. I generally have most of the SSD stuff in installed anyway, but as soon as this computer came in and I saw that it had a Corsair SSD in it, I just downloaded this. So here's Corsair SSD toolbox. Um, and as you can see, as it's got drive information, over provisioning, smart status, cloning, optimizing, and secure white. So let's select our Corsair Force GS here. So we can also do firmware updates and stuff like that. But what I want to know is the overall health of the drive. So we can do this from smart. So let's load that up and take a closer look. Now, generally speaking, 
I don't like SMART. Um, SMART is a drive's built-in self-diagnostics. SMART stands for something, but I can't remember what. Now, on a traditional hard drive, SMART very rarely triggers before the drive has actually failed, which means that SMART is basically useless, because by the time there is a problem in SMART, the drive has already failed and you're already toast. Uh, and it, you're better off just doing a sector scan on a traditional hard drive. But on an SSD, Smart can actually provide you with some extra useful information. And we can see that here. Uh, if we have a look at the information we've got available to us, let's start at the top. Retired block count. So um, that, the current value is at 95. And that's over a threshold of three. Now, that's saying that that's a pass, but that doesn't look right at all. The other thing we've got here is if we look down here, we've actually got a red mark here. SSD life left. Now this is a pretty arbitrary number, but that is actually flagging as failed. So Smart is saying there is a problem with this SSD. And in addition to that, we can also see that reallocation event, so sector reallocations, that is currently reading at 100 from a threshold of three. So that is way over what it wants to be as well. So are these numbers realistic? Because a lot of these, this is just numbers. We've got 103 and the, the SSD life left is one of 10. It's like, what does this mean? Well, we can at least see if this is realistic because we also have power on hours here. So what we can do is we can estimate how old this SSD is and how much usage it's had and see if that tallies with the life of the laptop. So at the moment, the power on hours is 18279. So what is that? Let's just get a calculator up and we can see if that number actually tallies with anything. So Let's take, so 18279, 18279, divided by 24, look, we'll convert hours into days, 761 days, so convert that into years, 365. So this laptop has had about two years of solid uptime. So let's assume that the computer is used every other day. That would make this SSD about four years old. And for a 128 gig Corsair Force SSD, that sounds about right. So it's had about four years of life uh, and we can see that after having various failing points, it's having issues. This is a semi early SSD and semi early, you know, it's not a really early SSD, but the older SSDs were not as reliable as the new ones are. Um, so the information we're seeing here all tallies up with what I would expect of for an SSD of this age. So we can look at these numbers and we can make an estimate and we can go, yeah, this SSD is kind of old and it's quite likely that it's having problems now. So that's what we're seeing here. So the long and the short of it is we've got a faulty SSD and that is why our boot manager is gone. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I'm going to wait for this backup to finish because then at least we've, we've recovered as much data as we can from the SSD. With this many unreadable sectors, there could be some files missing or corrupted in our backup. But there's not much I can do about that. If the customer didn't have a backup when the drive wasn't failing, that's their lookout. But from this snapshot backup, we're going to have most of the data. Um, if you've got less than a thousand unreadable sectors, you probably have more or less everything because a sector is very, very small. So if you've got less than a thousand unreadables, you've probably got a pretty much intact backup there. So that's got a couple of seconds remaining. While I wait for that to finish, let's just see how our mem test is going. So that's been running for about 12 minutes now. We are 58% uh, into a pass. And as a confidence test, that looks pretty good to me. Uh, we've, because we've seen that we've got a failing SSD and we've got no errors so far in our mem test, it looks like there's nothing wrong with the memory. So I'm going to abandon the memory test at this point because I have no reason to believe that there's faulty memory in this computer. If you've got lots of time on your hands, you can keep going with this just to feel better about it and just get that, that one full pass. Uh, however, I can see we've got a failing SSD. Um, we've got zero errors, 60% into our mem test. I think we know where our problem lies now. Right, and now our backup is finished. That is completed. So we'll take that to the start. And now I'm going to eject the SSD and I'm going to take that out of the equation. As far as I'm concerned, we're done with the Corsair SSD now. This guy has failed. We have taken a backup of it and we're finished with it. 
So now what we want to do is replace this with another one. So I'm going to change it out with just a modern equivalent. I'm going to drop in a, a Crucial MX500 SSD with this thing, uh, which is just a decent equivalent. Um, in terms of what SSD to replace with these days, the Crucial MX500 is a really good all-rounder. And if you're using two and a half inch drives like this, you're limited to the SATA connection, which is 500 megs per second. The MX500 is more than capable of saturating that and it's a decent brand, um, so I recommend that as an SSD. Um, the other alternative is we could also put an M2 SSD into this, so he could upgrade to a more fancy SSD. And for that, again, he can either use an MX500 M2 format card, uh, or he could move on to something more exotic, like a Samsung Evo, that would be an NVMe drive that would be super fast. However, it's worth bearing in mind that um, if if, the, uh, if your main SSD is the only SSD, you won't see the benefit of NVMe. The only time NVMe is really useful is if you're a very, very heavy user, like you're running lots of virtual machines on your computer and need a lot of IOPS, or if you have multiple SSDs in your computer and you're transferring between SSDs, that's when NVMe will really shine. On this particular computer with only a single SSD in though, it's not really gonna matter. So we're just gonna drop another two and a half inch drive in this for now. Okay, so now comes the point where we want to restore this computer to a working condition. And if you skipped all of my guff about explaining about diagnostics and stuff like that, then you've just rejoined us. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I have taken a backup of the data from this computer. Um, and I'm going to restore my backup onto this new SSD. Now, there's two things to keep in mind here, is that when we restore the backup, we're also going to restore the problem because we still have a mangled boot manager and our backup is a backup of a mangled boot manager. So we're gonna have to address that. But the first thing I wanna do is restore that onto a working SSD. So let's plug this guy into my workstation and get the data restored. Now, Snapshot does have the ability to restore a complete disk from images where you can take um, the set of partition images you have and restore all of them at the same time. But I find that's a little bit squicky, so I tend to just restore disk from file and I do my partitions one by one. So let's select that and I'm going to browse and start off with the first partition. So if we look at the three files we've got, we have D, which is primary one, there's our system reserve partition, and we can see it's 100 megs in size. Uh, then E is our Windows partition, primary two, and that's about 120 gigs in size. And then we've got HD3, which is the restore partition. So let's start with partition number one, which is system reserved. So I'm gonna open that and hit next. So as you can see, I've got a empty drive here where I've plugged in a brand new SSD. I'm gonna right click on the drive and hit restore master boot record. And what that will do is create the partitions automatically in the pattern that they previously were. So MBR was successfully restored. Now you'll notice that where we're going onto a bigger SSD here, um, we've now got this free space at the end. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna delete the restore partition, I'm gonna delete that. And then once we've got this thing back into Windows, we'll then grow this partition across the end space. And I'm just going to not bother with the restore partition because the restore partition is pretty worthless in my opinion. I have never used it effectively, so I'm not going to bother remaking it. It's not needed to run the computer. Right, now we're restoring partition one, so we'll select that and hit next. And uh, so yes, I want to continue. And that's gonna take no time at all because it's 100 megabytes. Done. Right, next one, restore disk from file. So now I'm going to select the Corsair one. So that was E drive, primary number two, 120 gigs in size, open. Next, and I'm gonna select that one. Next again, and yes, I want to continue. Right, and so now we're restoring the data from the main Windows system drive. Now, if you're moving to a smaller SSD for any reason, or if you're moving from like a 500 gigabyte hard drive and you're restoring onto an SSD because you're upgrading, you may run into issues where you're having to shrink your file system. That is a whole can of worms that I'm not going to go into in this video. That is a very dark art. It can be done and it can be done under extreme circumstances, but there's too much information to talk about in this video, so we're not going to. Watch out for that though. Right, that's gonna take 
Oh, it's going quite fast. That's going to take about 15 minutes. I'm going to leave that to run. I'll see you guys in a minute. Okay, our restore is complete. So I'm going to OK out of that. And I'm going to eject the SSD. And I'm going to unplug my Memtest flash drive. And we're going to hook up our new SSD. So I'm just going to trial fit this first because I'm expecting to have to take it out. And you'll see why when we get into this. Oh, I tell you, reverse mounting drives like this, so the cables are at the back, it looks very tidy when you open the computer up. It's an actual pain in the butt for actually mounting anything. Okay, right, our SSD is in. So let's turn it back on again. And let's see if it boots. It's not going to, but we'll see what it does. Right, and we're back to Boot Manager is missing. Now, this is exactly what we expected to see. Um, because we haven't actually fixed the faulty boot manager. However, we have resolved the underlying problem that caused the boot manager to get scrambled in the first place. So now when we fix this fault, we know it will actually stay fixed. So now let's move on to the quick fixes. So uh, I'm going to grab a Windows 10 flash drive. Now a Windows 10 flash drive is quite straightforward to make. Um, if you Google search for Windows 10 Media Creation Tool, it'll come up with the Microsoft website and you can download the Windows 10 Media Creation Tool directly from Microsoft and it will allow you to make a Windows 10 flash drive. And you can make your own Windows 10 flash drive for installing Windows 10. Um, and you don't need to provide any license information to do this. You can Windows 10 is freely available to download directly from Microsoft. You don't have to pirate it. Um, and then your licensing, that is tracked differently. Um, however, we don't need to go into the licensing in order to get this computer running. The point is you can make your Windows 10 flash drive and do your repairs just with this. So let's plug this thing in and we're gonna boot from it. So I'm gonna stick that in a Win USB port and I'm gonna control delete and I'm gonna F11 for boot menu. Okay, right, and at the top, Kingston Data Traveler, that's my Windows 10 flash drive, so let's boot from that. And we're going to attempt to repair our current Windows install. Now, spoiler alert, I don't think this is going to work. However, if it does work, it's a lot faster than the next thing I'm going to try. So we're gonna t we'll try it anyway and see if we get lucky. Okay, so we're gonna go through on United Kingdom, because we're in the right country. <laughs> and then I'm gonna click Repair Your Computer in the bottom left and I'm going to hit troubleshoot. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run startup repair. Startup repair never ever works but I'm going to try it because it takes about 30 seconds and it might work. So we always try the quick fixes first because you never know you might get lucky. And it didn't work. Okay right back to advanced options. Right so I'm going to go to troubleshoot again and I'm going to open up a command prompt. So that gets us to here. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is double check that our drives are mounted up properly. So I'm going to go through some, through some drive letters and check that everything is visible. So I'm going to start with C drive and do DIR. Okay, so that's our, um, uh, that's our data drive because we can see there's data there and no Windows directory. Okay, what about D? Okay, system reserve. So there's our system reserve drive. So that is on the system SSD. So the system SSD is there. Uh, what about E? DIR. Okay, that's our bootable USB drive because that's got Windows setup files on it. And F DIR. And there we go. So now we've actually got we've got a Windows directory and a users directory here. So that is actually the main thing we're interested in. So uh, it is mounted up. Okay, fine. Let's see if we can do the actual Windows built-in recovery tools. Um, and again, these don't work very often either, but I'm going to try them anyway because it might give us a quick repair. So I'm going to do boot rec, boot rec, which is boot recovery. And I'm going to do fix MBR. And that is going to write a new master boot record to the um, SSD to make sure that there is a compatible master boot record there. Um, now, I don't think that's our issue because we've got boot manager is missing, not uh, no system disk. But whatever, we've done it, it works. Uh, next, I'm going to do boot rec uh, fix boot. 
and that's given us access denied and this is one of the reasons why these quick fixes don't seem to work because I have suspicion for I think it's to do with um, the security of the system and stuff like that but while you're working from a USB drive it doesn't allow you to do this stuff because this would be a vector where you can inject um, virus um, uh, viruses into the boot sector of the drive and things like that so I think that's why you can't do this, but I'm not 100% certain on that, whatever. I'm mainly just showing you this stuff because these are the kind of commands you see when you Google search for this error. And I wanna show you how they never seem to work in real life, basically. Another thing that we can also do is we can try and rebuild the VCD so we can manually remake the bootloader. So to do that, we do boot rec rebuild VCD. And what that will do is it will look across the hard drives for any Windows installations that are available and it will add them to the bootloader. Um, and this is what is supposed to happen. Uh, so as you can see, it's found a Windows install. It's found it on F drive, which tallies with what we saw. That's where our Windows install currently is. So we'll say, yes, add that installation to the boot list. However, the requested system device cannot be found. So there's, again, there's an issue with it writing to where the bootloader is supposed to go. So that seems to be the root of our issue here. Those are the quick fixes, they haven't worked. So we're gonna to have to move on to the more long-winded one. Right, now I'm hitting reset to just reset the computer and we'll see if that has made any difference whatsoever. I don't think it will have, but we'll try it and see if we get lucky. Ah, there we go. We got lucky. Um, it's been a long time since that's ever worked for me before. However, um, it, the uh, the fix MBR and, and the BCD rebuild and all of that jazz, even though we were getting those access denied messages and stuff like that, it has actually fixed it. So there we go. We're back into Windows. It looks like we're running a very aggressive looking Flux profile. So it's all gone a very strange color. However, the fact is it's actually worked. Cool. So what if your boot manager is still broken and those quick fixes didn't work for you? Because as I say, they very rarely work for me. So it wouldn't surprise me if you're still in a broken condition. So I'll show you my next trick for that. First of all, you are going to need to make sure that you've made an image backup of your drive. So remember the SSD, uh, uh, remember the snapshot backup I made earlier on in the video, make sure you've done that because you will need it to do this fix. What we're going to do is make a clean install of Windows on our SSD, and then we're going to restore just the Windows partition, which means we'll have a completely vanilla system partition with our boot manager on it, but then we can restore our old Windows install on top of it and it will then boot the old one. So that's what we're going to do. Now, because we're going to reinstall Windows, the first thing I'm going to do is disconnect the hard drive from the computer because I don't, I don't want Windows to make any system partitions anywhere else except the SSD. So I'm going to fumble around behind these drives. Come on. There we go take out the hard drive so we've got just the ssd connected flapping in the breeze there now uh, because the windows installer has a nasty habit of plonking the system partitions on other drives which is a pain in the backside um, it seems to be a bit arbitrary when that happens so as far as i'm concerned it's easier to just disconnect everything else so we've got just the ssd plugged in uh, let's boot this thing up we're going to boot off of our windows 10 flash drive again uh, and we're going to do a clean install of Windows on it. So I'm just going to let that start up. And now, because I want to make sure that we've got no damaged or broken or any other nonsense partitions, I'm going to clean the SSD. So I'm going to do Shift F10 to get a command prompt. And then I'm going to resize the window so my face isn't in the way. And I'm going to go disk part, all one word. This takes a moment to load, so just be patient. So now I need to know which drive I want to clean. So I'm going to do list disk. And we can see we've got two disks connected. We've got disk zero is our 500 gig SSD that we fitted. And disk one is a 16 gigabyte flash drive that we've got connected. As you can see, you get losses because of gigabytes and gigabytes, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to select disk zero. And now I'm going to just type in clean and press enter. And this will just nuke the disk from orbit. 
Word of warning, this is going to destroy all the data on the drive. Make sure you're backed up. You should have backed up by now if you haven't already. Let's continue. Okay, there we go. Uh, so the disk has been cleaned. I'm going to exit out of disk part and then exit out of command line. And now I'm just going to go through and do just a standard install of Windows. So install now. I'm going to say I don't have a product key because this motherboard is already activated for Windows 10. So I can just proceed through this without providing any license information. Um, and uh, I think it's licensed for Windows 10 Home. So I'm going with that. There's no reason for it to be running pro. All right. We accept the terms. Custom install. As you can see, the drive is unallocated because we cleaned it. So we can just click next and Windows will automatically make those system partitions again. And it will just make the ones it needs, no more, no less. Right, let's let that go through. Because we're installing from a USB 3 flash drive onto an SSD, this should take about 10 minutes. So I'll see you when we get to the first run, Wizard. Okay, right, here we are at the first run. Um, and I've just, gone, I've just gone through and I just added the keyboard layout and stuff like that. And I'm literally just going to blast through all of this because... I don't care about this Windows install. I just need to get to desktop so I can do a clean shutdown. So I'm literally just going to bash in user, no password, and I'm just going to decline Cortana. No, no, no. And I'm literally just going to enter space through all of this. There we go. And I'm just going to go straight through to the desktop, and then I'm going to shut the computer down. Of course, theoretically, I could probably just cut the power at the back right now, but I don't want to do that just because it just doesn't seem like a good idea. If I'm patient and I wait two minutes, we'll be on the desktop and I can do a clean shutdown. Okay, we made it. Right click, shut down. Good night. So now we're going to shut the computer down and I'm going to take the SSD out and plug it back into my workstation again. And I'm going to start Drive Snapshot back up, and I'm going to restore disk from file. And once again, now this time, instead of starting off with the first partition, we're going to restore just the Corsair Primary 2 partition. So let's open that and hit Next. And as you can see, Windows has made a couple of different partitions. And now the weird thing is, sometimes these partitions appear, and sometimes they don't. And sometimes... Like, we can see there's actually four partitions here, but if I open up, this is where it gets really squicky, because if I open up disk management and look at it in there, in disk management, there's three partitions. There's the recovery, a 100 meg system partition, and then the Windows partition. And this is why trying to repair this boot manager issue manually always seems to be incredibly squicky because I, Windows just seems to make these partitions at random. I'm sure there's a pattern to it, but I have never actually managed to figure out what the pattern is. It seems to, pen, to depend on what version of Windows you're running, like what build as well, the hardware, whether there's other drives in the computer. And this is why when you start trying to rebuild your boot, your boot manager manually, just sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So yeah, that's why I use this, what appears to be a very convoluted method, because as convoluted as my method is, it enables Windows to make, it, make the partitions itself in the way that it wants to, without me interfering with it. So that's why we're going through all of these hoops. So anyway, so I'm going to restore my Windows install onto the main partition here where Windows is. So at the moment it's D because part, you know letters are arbitrary. However, we're restoring it to there. And what's going to happen now is the boot manager that we just made with that new Windows install, um, the boot manager that we just made with that new Windows install is expecting to find Windows on that D partition. So we're going to dump our old Windows partition there. And then when we plug it all back in and turn it on, it'll still start up because there's still our Windows install where it's expecting to find one, but it'll have all of our stuff there as well. So let's let this progress bar crack on through. And then when we reboot, we should find all of the data is there again. 
Okay, the imaging is complete, so I'm going to OK out of that, exit snapshot, and safely remove the drive. And we're going to plug it back into the computer. And now when we turn it all on, we should find that it boots back up with all of the data intact. Here we go. Ta-da! And there is all of the customer's data, all of their programs, all of their games, their config, their setup, all intact. And so that is the, that's the end all way of fixing this. And here comes Flux again. <laughs> so yes, that's the end all way of fixing this um, without having to do manual rebuilding and stuff like that. So it's a bit convoluted because you've got to do a Windows install and then overwrite that again and things like that. But as you can see, that's a surefire way of fixing the Windows install without losing all your installed programs. And you can use this same method um, if you've got uh, just like no system disk errors and things like that. It's very, very handy. So we're basically all finished here now. So um, I've shown you how we can approach the problem of boot manager not found uh, and how we can look into the un possible underlying causes for it and resolve those and then fix the boot manager not found without losing your Windows install. And we showed a couple of different methods for that. Now, again, the problem with computer diagnostics is there's always slightly different fixes depending on exactly how the problem presents itself. Um, and like, you know, if you ended up with faulty RAM or it was some other reason why your boot manager got mangled, then your fix might be slightly different to what I've done here. But hopefully this video was an interesting insight into how to approach the problem and look into it and analyze what has happened. So I hope that was all interesting. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you all next time. Bye for now.